Good morning, Grid Connections listeners. I'm your host, Chase, and the Grid Connections podcast is the podcast designed to help empower your electric vehicle knowledge. Today, we're exploring converting traditional combustion engine vehicles to electric and general EV maintenance. Our guest today is none other than Maverick Knowles, the co-founder of Legacy EV. His company is an aftermarket automotive company helping educate the workforce on electric vehicle conversions and provide electric vehicle parts distribution. Legacy EV is really trying to make EV conversions and maintenance easier for everyone. I actually was able to take Legacy EV's in-person electric vehicle conversion course at their facility in Tempe last May, and I've included a link to it in the show notes. It was a great experience to meet others in the space, most from traditional but high-end mechanic shops to learn not just in a detailed classroom environment, but also get extensive hands-on experience in the shop to see what making a traditional combustion car into an electric vehicle is all about. I'm actually working on my own electric vehicle conversion currently of a 1987 Land Rover Defender 90. And in a previous episode, we spoke with Chris Hazel. He's the founder of Felton and their Defender kit, among others that they offer for converting your own combustion vehicle to electric. Coincidentally, Legacy EV is one of Felton's distributors of their conversion kits in the U.S., and I've also shared a link to that in the show notes for today. Anyone that is listening should also check out that episode because it really is a great intro and covers a lot of different topics of what it takes to get the right kit for your conversion and kind of some of the interesting ways that Felton's approaching that. And just to clarify, Legacy EV also does supply many other kits from other vendors, but uh, it's just been great to speak with the team at Felton because of my own personal interest around their Defender kit. But Legacy EV, especially if you're based in the U.S., really has a just about a kit for every use case and different car out there. So I really recommend checking out their site. But today's conversation was really fascinating with Maverick. It was pretty interesting to learn about his own experiences with uh, how he got in, uh, involved with electric vehicles and how he kind of made a pretty big pivot from teaching to uh, co-founding Legacy EV and what it takes to really be in that space with making it as easy to find the right parts and deal with supply chain headaches to also being able to provide the education that's definitely needed for those who are kind of curious about converting their own vehicles, or even if you're a mechanic in a shop and want to learn more about working on electric vehicles or what it takes to really know and how to do that safely. So I really enjoy this conversation. I'm hoping to have uh, people like him and more in the future. But with that, enjoy. Thank you for joining us today, Maverick. Can you just give us a little information about uh, yourself and Legacy EV? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Legacy EV was founded conceptually back in 2019. Uh, my co-founder, Rob Ward, has been a lifelong gearhead and a little bit skeptical towards the EV movement until he took a ride in a Tesla P100D and really felt the torque and performance that EV platforms have to offer. And uh, at the time, I think I was one of the only people he knew that drove an EV. I'd been an early adopter in the EV movement was driving a 2014 Ford Focus Electric with a 72 mile range. And uh, actually the the first time that I went to drive that car, the dealership was about 50, 55 miles from my house. And I knew the car had a 72 mile range. So I bought it and got on the freeway in Arizona and turned on the AC and uh, the range went from 72 down to 48. I was like, I'm not going to make it home. This is crazy. What am I supposed to do? Oh, wow. And uh, just real quick, like learning experience with EVs that, okay, there's other factors that have parasitic loss impact on the battery range and and what can happen. And so uh, Rob spent many days picking me up with a stranded battery and no range. Um, So that was my introduction into EV. (laughs) Professionally, I started out. That's truly a crash course. That that is. I, I love yeah. that. that. That's wild. No, I, I, I'm sorry. Keep going. No, no, you're good. Yeah, it, it was wild. And I love to have that story to share back when people are like a 72 mile range. That's crazy. I didn't even know they made EVs with that little battery. And it's like, yeah, in the, in the early days, that's that's what they had. Um, now it feels like 140 is a really low mile mileage range. But um, yeah, anyway, I I, uh, I started out professionally in education. So I graduated from the University of Washington and had plans to go to law school. So uh, I applied for a program called Teach for America, and that program placed me in Phoenix, teaching at a new charter school. I was teaching 
uh, reading and writing to um, English language learners and really just fell in love with education. I was like, wow, this is, this is awesome. I had a ton of fun and uh, was getting ready to apply to law school. And my wife was getting ready to apply to grad school at the same time. And so she got into grad school up in Washington and I was like, you know what, I'm going to teach for a few more years, stay in education. And uh, I actually found a, a new charter school that had just been started up in Washington that I was able to join on as the math director for. And they were um, a charter school that was all project-based learning, very hands-on, like engineering, STEM, and robotics. And so I really got to learn the ropes of building curriculum there, where we developed all new curriculum programs that were based around math that were very hands-on, project-based learning, had students working on Arduino technology like every day, building really, really cool things, prosthetic arms, you name it. and just really opened my eyes to how much can be done when you can implement like really rigorous learning activities with hands-on approach to learning. And so that's kind of the basis for how we approach learning at Legacy EV2. A lot of our learning is built around these hands-on experiences and how can we make sure they're rigorous, but also really let people learn the technical by doing. Um, and so, yeah, when Rob approached me to start Legacy EV back in 2019, I was, I was actually getting ready to apply to law school. I had taken the LSAT. I was writing my applications and I was just feeling like, I don't know if law school is, is for me. So when he approached me with the idea, I was like, absolutely. I'd love to. That sounds way better than uh, reading contracts all day, which I ironically spend a large portion of my day doing when we have big deals coming through the pipeline. But um, yeah, it's been really fun. It's been a wild ride since we started. And I guess that that's my background. I didn't talk much about legacy, but I can I can <laughs> dive into a little bit about who legacy is now as well. Uh, for anybody that's new, if that sounds good to you, Jason. Yeah, that, that'd be great. I definitely want to come back to learn more about how you landed on the Ford Electric because that is such a rare car and ha was such low volume. So no, yeah. I, I think first let's let's go into Legacy EV and then I have so many questions about that alone. Uh, but okay, this is cool. great. And it, coincidentally, my wife is a lawyer in the energy law space. And I think yeah, she'd okay. probably agree with you. You made the right choice. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I, uh, yeah, don't connect with people very often that are also lawyers in this space, but that's cool. And yeah, happy to talk more about the Ford. I'll, I'll keep the intro on Legacy EV a little yeah, bit shorter yeah, yeah. than I did my own. But Legacy EV is an aftermarket automotive company focused on EV parts distribution and workforce development. So uh, we distribute aftermarket parts for EVs focused on mostly EV conversions, but we also support um, EV repair shops and replacement equipment for electric vehicles. And then we provide all the training that's needed to come along with that. So that's really how our customer journey starts is people come to us to get trained so they can understand this stuff better. And then they really trust us as this brand agnostic uh, parts hub to come and get the equipment they need to go out and do the work that they've now been trained for. We also support like junior colleges, tech schools, high school CTE programs, STEM programs with the curriculum and hardware they need to teach programs around e-mobility. Um, so to date, we have about 50 authorized installers around the country. That's, that's how our parts get out into the world with, uh, to the end user really is we have authorized installers that convert vehicles from gas to electric for, um, customers and we support them with the parts and training that they need. And then we're supporting about 18 schools around the country right now and, and growing probably will be at about 30 by the end of this year. Oh, wow. That's awesome. I, I knew yeah. just kind of from following you guys that that program was starting to take out, but it's great to see that there's been so much growth. I guess if anyone is listening, what would be the best way that um, if they have a school or kind of educator that wants to reach out to you to learn more about that program? Yeah, absolutely. You can reach out to us at info at LegacyEV.com. You can also check out our Legacy EV Academy. It's academy.legacyev.com. That's our online learning ecosystem that uh, we just relaunched. Um, and do its like second iteration now that has a lot of our online learning materials where you can start to explore and see what's available for you to learn with online. Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, it's such a great thing that your team is doing. And it's kind of funny because the way I came across Legacy EV was the opposite of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I was actually kind of looking for parts to do a conversion, saw a yeah. lot of the stuff that you had and realized that even in my own kind of knowledge base, I was pretty rusty. Uh, yeah. And still just had a lot of questions, especially with some of these kits. So I first did that online course. It, that part, I think, was good, but was pretty familiar, like, I think, pretty aligned with what I already knew. And yeah. I took the plunge and then did the actual course in May. And I think what I enjoyed so much about that was there was obviously kind of the curriculum where you're in the class and you're learning. Uh, and it was very detailed and subject uh, specific. 
that kind of maybe some of these other programs, or especially if you're kind of doing like an online course, doesn't get into that fine level of detail. And then it was right. augmented with so much hands-on experience. And I think that was the huge thing for me. Um, and I realized I was kind of in an interesting, I was kind of just like the random average Joe in there who was curious about this. Uh, mm -hmm. There was one other guy that was um, an educator, uh, I believe at a high school in Boise. And then it was mm -hmm. mostly like Shelby America and like very large, very <laughs> well-established um, yeah. group uh, companies with mechan uh, techs and, uh, that were trying to really learn about how to now do EVs. And so it was yeah. just a really great uh, learning experience. And I, I think what was really cool about it too was just such a wide variation in the people who were there and why they were there. Um, yeah, so I've really totally. been recommending your guys' program and it's, it's just great to see how much that's grown. Well, thank you. Yeah, we always appreciate that. And you bring up a good point that really, you know, our business model is supporting individuals and businesses in whatever they need to be able to adopt and adapt their business to support electrification. And so that can be these like legacy companies like Shelby American that are figuring out what is their business look like in a world of EV to companies that are providing paint for battery modules that goes inside and keeps them you know, the paint is a different type of paint than you would see in, in any other application. And they want their sales reps to be able to talk about the EV and how it works. And so they send them to us. And so it's really surprising how many different types of businesses our training can support. Uh, but it's really, yeah, the fundamentals of EV is, is a fun way for people to learn out there in the shop, looking at conversions, looking at the training benches and getting their hands on the equipment. So it makes a really fun learning experience. For sure. And I, I think my recommendation even to the team was like, I would almost pay the money again, just to like have the two days of where you're wiring up the system and doing kind of these, uh, just the hands on parts of it, because it's so yeah. much nicer and easier to make those mistakes on your uh, demo and kind of the educational uh, stuff you have there versus actually trying to wire this stuff through and do it in car. Um, yeah, but yeah I, I think it's such a great program that you guys are doing. And it's not the only program out there, but I, I think by far, at least in North America, for sure, um, since a little bit Wild West, as far as the regulations as to what qualifies to be an EV tech. And I know you guys are doing actually a lot to kind of help build those rules and put those in place. Um, but I, I think it's great to see that you guys are kind of having not just the educational component, but also you can get everything from a used Tesla drive unit to a brand new kit. And it really does give you a really full spectrum of how much you're trying to do maybe a build on a budget to do some kind of the higher end builds as well. But um, I guess that, that reminds me, I, I'd be curious to just kind of learn a bit more about, um, well, okay, before we get too much of this, because I, I think I can nerd out this all day, let's let's go yeah. back to this Ford, the Ford Electric. I, I have a couple of questions okay. about that, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, what, for sure. how, how did you choose that? Because back then, you said it was 2014, yeah. it would have been... It would have been like that, the Nissan Leaf, and then obviously like maybe a Model S or something or uh, Tesla yeah. Roadster, but there's a pretty big yep. price delta to go up to that. But yeah, can you share yeah. what, um, how you landed on that? Yeah, for sure. Well, so I bought it in, it was either late 2015 or early 2016. So it was a used model. And I think at the time I was looking at uh, the Nissan Leaf. There was the, the BMW that's electric that I think had also just come out, but it was quite a bit more expensive. Right. And then, yeah, Tesla Model S. Um, and that was, that was really it. And so for me, actually what started my whole journey down the path of electrification is I was, I was interested in it for the environmental aspect, but really it was, I could use the carpool lane in the state of Arizona. And I was like, I don't care what I have to do to be able to charge. I'll figure this out if I can use a carpool lane. Cause I was commuting like an hour and 15 minutes to work and probably 30 minutes of that was in traffic. It could have been like a 45 minute commute if I could use the carpool lane. And so I just started looking and I was like, how can I figure this out? And what's the cheapest car at the time I was driving a 2003 Volkswagen Jetta 1.8 T, which was super fun to drive, but uh, yeah, yeah. it was a cheap car, right? In, in 2015, I think I spent like $4,000 on that car. And so I was like, I didn't have a bunch of money. I was a teacher just starting out out of college. And so I needed something that was inexpensive. So I wasn't going to do the BMW or the Tesla. And so I was between the Nissan and the Ford Focus. And they had pretty similar range, but I liked how the Focus looked way better. I was like, I don't really yeah. want to drive a Nissan Leaf. It just it wasn't doing it for me without look. And the Ford Focus looks 
just like the gas Ford Focus. You can't even tell the difference except for the blue blue cloud blue cloud plate, and then uh, there's no exhaust. So that was really the only way that you could tell the difference. But I just like the look, and I thought at the time 72 mile range would do it. It was like a 40 mile commute to work, so I was like, okay, I'll get to work, I'll charge a little bit, and then I'll drive home. Um, and there was no EV charger at my work, so I brought the little wall outlet, like oh. the 110, and I plug <laughs> it in to like a lamp post outside my work, and then I'd charge it, and I'd get like eight miles on the day, and that was it. But it worked; it got me home. I just barely had enough to recharge so, overnight. Okay, so it was enough to. to go both ways. Gotcha. Yeah, just barely though. I mean, I had I had to plug in at work. <laughs> Although here's the real, here's another really follow funny follow up to that story. Um, after about six months of ownership, the high voltage battery went out, oh, and wow. I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is not good." Like, and so I took it to the Ford dealer, and they told me it was going to cost thirty six thousand dollars to replace oh, the battery. I paid eight thousand dollars for the car. Maybe even, I was going to ask how much like, did it cost to actually buy it? Yeah, yeah, I I think I paid under. 8,000. I think it was like 7,500 or something like that. It was, oh, it wow. was pretty inexpensive. And, uh, especially at, at the time it had 16,000 miles on it and was a 2014. I was like, this is the newest car I've ever driven and a backup camera. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is great. I'll do this all day. But the battery went out and I was like, that's way more than what I paid for the car. Like, how am I going to do this? Turns out it was under warranty, eight year, hundred thousand mile warranty. So for oh, nice footed the bill. And so they didn't have any more 2014 packs. They put a 20, 2017 pack in the car. And so I got 140 mile range. Oh, wow. So I got like the new, the new vehicles. Yeah, the new vehicle range. And so then when I went to sell that car, I sold it for like $12,000, which was more than I paid. And I saved the money on gas every month driving it. So I was like, EVs are the future. This is the way to tell. <laughs> I just made so much money out of this car. It's amazing. Uh, no, that's not everybody's experience. I think that was pretty So unique, between I was obviously pretty doing legacy EV and teaching, now you're doing car flipping is kind of what the <laughs> takeaway from right. that experience yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's all. I'm kind of curious. When you took it in, what did the dealership say? Do you remember as far as like they didn't want to touch it or they had really no idea what to do with kind of the battery replacement and that experience? I mean, I, I can imagine that nowadays. I was talking to someone who had an issue with a Ford Mach-E recently and then uh, kind of the high voltage problem we was seeing a year ago. I can't even imagine what that would have been in like 26. Yeah, it was definitely even more of the Wild West back then than it is today. I showed up and they were like, we've never seen one of these, so we don't know what to do. It's going to take a while. I think it took them like three weeks just to get me the quote on what it was going to cost to repair oh, it. Wow. And then I think it was with them for three months replacing the high voltage battery pack. Um, so, yeah, it was it was pretty pretty wild and the bill i wish i still had the bill i should see if i can find it but yeah everything that went into fixing that car's battery it was more expensive than buying a new 2017 right. like the car was like technically totaled if it wasn't under warranty which is just wild um so yeah i think for me that was a really eye-opening experience that, like there this is cool that i'm like being taken care of and i get a new battery pack and this is all great but like what's going to happen once these things are out of warranty how our technicians sure. going to know how to replace it? Because I, I only had the Ford dealer. That was the only place I could go. That was the only place that sold the battery. So like even the local mechanic that I was used to going to, he was like, don't bring it here. I can't do anything for yeah. you. And so it just started to like get the wheels spinning on. What is this going to look like in 20 years? Like when these, a ton of these vehicles are out of warranty and still technically like they're on the road, they're getting bought in the used vehicle market, you know? Um, and so I like to think that that's, a, a large part of what we're addressing today is we're helping shops get access to training so they can figure out what it looks like to do work in this space. And we're supporting shops that are replacing Nissan Leaf battery packs. Um, so we we have a partner that we work with where we source the Nissan Leaf components to sell them into the aftermarket where people can also come to us and buy those packs and then install them on Leafs that have serious battery degradation. You can get new batteries and replace those. So um, just starts to open up the world of, of possibilities for what you can do in this space. I think there's a ton of opportunity here for sure. Yeah, that's great. And I, I think you're totally right that there's such a large opportunity, whether it be from people doing the classic car kind of resto mod EV conversion to just existing uh, electric vehicle maintenance, which is only going to grow with more and more of these on the roads. 
Uh, I guess the only other question I had is that that's wild that you essentially didn't have a car for four months. Did they give mm-hmm. you a loaner or what, what exactly, how did that work out? Yeah, they did. I had a, a Ford. Oh, what did I have? Yeah. I got a loaner, a gas hard car. And so it was a bummer. I was like, I'm going to have to pay for gas now, which I didn't. I had free charging at the apartment that I was living at while I was a teacher. Oh, and nice. I got to charge for free at work. So I was saving all that money on gas. <laughs> for a long commute you know um but then for that brief period of time i had to pay for gas which was a bummer and couldn't use the carpool lane so right was here's a double whammy a couple months yeah but i was thankful that it was under warranty and um yeah it was very very helpful that the batteries do come with such such long warranties and it's interesting i mean i love the phoenix era i've got family down there and I, I think, especially with those early EVs, I know the Leaf had the issue with it being, uh, I believe, just air cooled and not liquid cooled. I'm not sure about the Ford. Going from the 70 mile range to the 140 mile range, when you turned on the AC, was there still a pretty noticeable difference in range, or had there been kind of changes to kind of the thermal management at all with that change to the new battery? You know, that's a good question. I haven't even looked up the specs of that (laughs) car since I have become more knowledgeable around EV technology. Um, I believe it was just an an air-cooled pack. Um, Yeah, I don't even think they were really doing liquid cooling at at the time, Um, but definitely saw range decrease. I think instead of 142, it was like 117 or something like that. Um, So still a, a big dip. And he was the other... Thing that really killed it but that's also when i learned like oh this car has seat heat and that's like a huge reason why is because cabin <laughs> heat takes way more energy than seat heat and so yeah on you don't get very many cold winter mornings in arizona but occasionally right. it's down in like the 30s or unless 40s, you're up in flat so, staff or something yeah right yeah so i'd get out there and i'd turn on the seat heat and i'd let it warm up or the car also you could program it to uh, have a schedule so i like had my commute oh, scheduled nice. so while it was plugged in it would turn on cabin heat and get the car up to temperature while it was plugged in so it wouldn't take battery life um which was super cool to to be able to have those features and um mess with a lot of that which helped with range and so i just started to learn learn the tips i learned how to drive it better and all those things back in 20 2015 2016 well i think that's so funny because that's such a common experience where it's like they're very clear reason for, I mean, I, I think obviously a lot of people have bought EVs for environmental reasons, but I think so, or, or if they do, it's almost secondary where there is yeah. a lot of it. It's just kind of curiosity. Uh, there's obviously the HOV, the uh, savings, other, I think actually kind of reasons that people will buy it. And then there's kind of the secondary benefits of it. And yeah. to hear kind of your experience of like kind of going in with not really know, and especially back then, there just wasn't a whole lot of knowledge. Uh, about these different systems. And I, I think it's really cool to see some of this in the training I did where, I mean, obviously I think everyone thinks about the battery and the motor, but the biggest thing for sure is really the thermals to maintain the vehicle yeah. over time and trying to minimize those um, big deltas you can see in energy usage or even degradation. But yeah. okay, you, you sell the electric, you make a profit with that. <laughs> and from there, is that kind of around the time you were pretty much leaning into legacy EV? And was it at that time, really the focus on education and then kind of became selling parts as well? Or was it kind of uh, both at the same time? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, when Rob approached me with the idea, the authorized installer network was always a part of, of what the business would look like. We knew that um, you know, we wanted to be able to create a trusted network of technicians who could build these cars for people. And really that helps also establish trust with the manufacturers that like they, they trust us to distribute their parts and get them in the hands of knowledgeable technicians. And so in order to do that, there needed to be some aspect of training. Um, and then I think where I brought some like vision into the picture was just around the, the robustness of that training and what it needed to look like. And then the opportunity to also work with schools to build out talent pipelines to help build out a network of technicians starting out of, of their education journey through their Votech school or, or CTE program, whatever it is. And so training has always been a, a part of the vision of legacy from the beginning, but as we've like moved more and more into supporting more shops, we've realized how important it is in the journey of like pretty much everybody needs some, some level of training to um, be able to access 
the opportunity that electrification electrification is going to provide in the automotive market. And so that's really where the journey starts for a lot of people, for sure. Well, and I, I think you're, uh, you're totally right that you just, <laughs> there's, there's a part where you also just have to get your hands dirty and learn this. And I think that's what makes your program so good as it has that element with the training benches too. But, um, we actually had Chris Felton or Chris Hazel on the CEO of Felton, uh, yeah. back in December. And one, I'm obviously, uh, I have a 1987 Land Rover Defender 90 that I'm looking to convert to electric. So most of yeah. that episode was me just drooling over what their new kit is. And I've heard you guys are <laughs> yeah. going to be the ones importing it. So very excited for that. Yeah. But yeah. Um, it was really interesting talking to him about how in the EU and the UK, the definition for when EV tech has to do or what even an e, a converted EV has to meet is actually pretty well fleshed out at this point. Yeah. And I know your team was kind of pushing for some of that here domestically and also kind of having some of those uh, discussions at the most recent SEMA event in Las Vegas. Is there any kind of updates or anything you can also share about what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to find to be like those ideal um, recommendations for what a qualified EV tech would be? Yeah, absolutely. And and as you were asking that, it also sparked the thought that I had earlier that I wanted to share when we were talking about the online yeah. program versus the in-person too. And uh, a big strategy behind the 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 reason the online program is built the way that it is is so that we can cover the base level, like the fundamentals of what people need to know before they come in person and start getting to tinker in a hands-on environment. For we sure. don't want to preload too much of like what people need to know if we can accomplish it through the hands-on learning experiences when they come in. But we also want to make sure everybody starts at the same like level playing field when they come in for the hands-on. That way we can be as efficient as possible with everybody's time. So online, you get to learn about Ohm's Law and Watt's Law and efficiency yeah. of EVs and even how like the type of tire you use affects range and what that looks like and how you estimate it. And so we go over a lot of that stuff uh, in the online course and it's pretty, pretty fundamental, like pretty, pretty basic, but, um, it's important to have that covered before people come in. Uh, and then, yeah, on standards, we're, we're definitely heavily involved in standards. A big reason that we started out in standards was because we're, we're building training. We need to have a benchmark or a watermark for what it means to be a knowledgeable technician. And all my time in education, it's, it's built around building training programs that meet standards. And so how do you build uh, training programs if you don't have outcomes and if you don't have standards defined. And so before we even started developing our programs, we defined the outcomes. These are the standards that we want technicians who go through our course to be able to hit. And we spent a long time developing those standards. We came up with like 148 and we realized, wow, there's a ton of value in these standards. And this really needs to be communicated openly to the rest of the world. So everybody else can say, yeah, these standards are good. Let's take these and let's say that, that that's what it means to be a knowledgeable technician and let's provide support for that and endorsement. That also means that other companies can go build programs to those same standards. And we welcome that. We want the best programs available for all technicians. But really what it does for the tech is it provides an opportunity to get like manufacturer endorsement and employer endorsement on the standards. So we've got more than two dozen uh, industry stakeholders endorsing those standards now that we developed for what it means to be a knowledgeable technician. We took them out of Legacy EV and we put them in a nonprofit called the uh, Electric Vehicle Technician Education Council. We're actually going to be switching names oh, cool. here shortly, likely to the Electric Vehicle Standards Council, because that council has a 12-member board, and that board oversees all the standards that we amend and ratify. And that board has an interest in also setting standards for aftermarket battery technology, for repowers, and the goal with this organization is not to create some like big government agency that tells people what they should and shouldn't do with their EVs. It's more to provide a guiding light for self-regulation of, okay, we want to make sure that we're all doing this the best and safest way possible. And as a shop owner, like that's what I would want. I would want to know what is the standard right. one, like what's the right way to do it. And so we want to give that roadmap to people. We're not enforcing it. We're not like putting teeth in it and saying, yeah, to get X, Y, Z, you have to meet these standards. It's just, here's the standards of what the best minds in the industry think we should all be doing. And let's provide this info out there for self-regulation purposes. And that that's where we're at today with it. It's uh, been a really fun group to be a part of. We've got everybody from Chris Hazel from Felton to uh, Kirk Miller from Hypercraft, 
um, to APP EV, to Amper EV, to Revolt, to Torque Trends, you name it, Kindred Motors. Wow. Uh, we've got a really nice. wide and, and broad group that represents a lot of different stakeholders. Insurance industry is on it. So, um, yeah, it's cool to be able to have everybody come together and um, have this mind melt where we can come up with these standards and make sure that we're trying to guide the industry in the right direction, uh, from least like a cohesive and unified front. Which is great. And I, I think something I need, uh, something the industry for sure needs just between so many people learning all of these new things and how many variables there are when doing a conversion. And for those listening, I swear I'm not uh, sponsored by Legacy EV, at least not yet. <laughs> uh, but um, it's, it's funny you mentioned kind of one of the things that really surprised me that I found really interesting was uh, your team had a uh, it's it's really cool. It was an orange Chevy pickup, I think, that was done by TFL as a conversion. And uh -huh. obviously, they kind of did like a, I think they did like in 48 hours. It was like the down and dirty, like quick conversion. Yeah. Uh, and so it's it's a good kind of like test meal to show like what this could look like, what you can do. But what I found the most fascinating about it is when we go around, it's like, now, if you were to do this, what would you not do? And you can kind of find some of these like, well, I probably wouldn't have put some of the, uh, 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 the disconnects and other stuff behind the battery, because if you get an accident, right. it's just going to go right through that and destroy all that. And then it might catch on fire. And so there's, yeah. there's also just like this whole other level of um, planning and kind of thinking through design yeah. that it like immediately makes sense. But once again, it helps that you have that right there to see. And it yeah. just shows that um, there's other there with just about anything. There's right ways and wrong ways. And, I think that program does a really good job of showing uh, how some people have done it and ways to just like when you're doing your own build, how to proactively like try to think of these things in advance to really yeah. avoid these uh, sorts of mistakes or potential. Um, not not that, that like some of the stuff they did was wrong, but once again, just kind of thinking if you're doing your build in more than 48 hours, how to kind of build it in a safer way, which I, I thought was really cool and really fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. And just so we don't get eaten alive by the gearheads out there, it was an F100. It was, a, I think it was a F Oh, that's F1. right. That's right. Ford F100. Yeah. yeah. But uh, no, you're right. And fair, that's something fair. we talk about a lot. And we, you know, even as, as a teacher back in the day, I have multiple projects that like, if I'm trying to show students, you know, grading on a rubric is much different than grading on a test. And so like, let's look at these three projects and just tell me like, what do you think this would score? And having them think about it and look at non-examples and examples and things that fall in the middle is a really important process of synthesizing the learning and seeing, okay, yeah, I wouldn't do X, Y, Z, but I would do this. And it's, you know, even the standards around what is safe and what is not around the electric vehicle conversion industry has shifted a lot in the last sure. 20 years. I mean, we went from lead sleds to lithium ion batteries over the last decade and a half and like it just looks way way different and so yeah it's like at the time it was that that vehicle has high voltage battery disconnects i think that was one of the first builds i saw with a high voltage battery yeah, disconnect yeah. which is wild and then all of a sudden it's like okay well it's actually not in a great spot because yeah if you get a rear impact then it's it's not in the safest place and um yeah it's a uh, it's good to be able to look at those examples and have learnings and takeaways and even like msd switches or nearly impossible to right. source four years ago when we started legacy it was like really difficult to find where can you get these from and now it's like okay we've got a good supplier we make this a requirement on on all our kit bombs and it's included but like that that wasn't available when we started and so um, yeah it's a constant progression i think we're at a really good spot with with safety standards now um as in the industry goes but it's going to continue to evolve as well for sure and it's funny how you just said over the past 20 years how ev conversions have changed and i don't even think for most people evs were in the back of their minds for new cars for like the last five years but you're totally right like you can go onto youtube you can see all these videos and there there have been a lot of groups that have been doing this for a couple of decades but it's so yeah. funny how it's so much of a homebrew experiment kind of like it was up there with like oh yeah i've got an old mercedes that runs biodiesel or i'm uh, brewing a small batch of beer in my garage. Like it's a very, it was a very experimental kind of just like a uh, small group of people kind of tinkering with this to now a much more advanced, uh, <laughs> much more yeah. uh, thought out kind of way of, of doing these builds and even not even doing the builds, but doing the builds as kits. 
Whereas yeah. uh, before it was kind of like, oh, I might have to kind of figure this out, drill that hole and figure it out. Whereas now you can actually buy kits for these conversions that go right onto like the old uh, engine mounts, making the conversion so much simpler and honestly safer. Yeah, totally. I think even when, when we started Legacy, we kind of were at this like inflection point of like, if you're doing conversions now, you're definitely still like pioneering. You you could make the right. the first electric vehicle that's been in that make and model that's that's ever existed. We still have customers that are like, that's never been electrified before. That's super cool. It's going to be awesome. Um, but the industry is growing so fast that it's like becoming less and less about pioneering and more and more about like using products with like established reputation. And um, it's really interesting to see that shift go from like, we're supporting manufacturers that were making things in their garage. And now it's like they have right, right. manufacturing plants and they have distribution through us. And it's like the industry is really, really taking off. And so it's been really cool to be able to see that from like the moment we entered to like where we're at today. It's only been four years, but it's like so right. much has happened in that four years. It's wild. So I hope that someday somebody like makes a documentary about the EV conversion industry and we can talk about these stories of the craziness of how it started and where we're at today. But uh, yeah, it's definitely, things are getting a lot simpler, plug and play kits, bolt on systems for specific vehicles. Felton does a great job of that. APP does a great job of that. Um, it's really cool to see how this all comes together. Yeah. And I actually, uh, I am kind of curious to learn more about maybe some of the requirements you have for finding vendors or like which or kind of some things that maybe you don't go with, but uh, real, real quickly, kind of, I think tying a lot of these themes together was I know legacy EV had a large presence at SEMA this past year. And I'm not, were you at SEMA as well? Or I was, I had to fly out for a day cause I had a meeting uh, back in Phoenix that I had to be at, but other than that, I was there. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Um, and admittedly, I really wanted to be there, but it was coincidentally the weekend I was getting married. So that oh, didn't work out this year. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. But uh, it, yeah. as funny as it is, my wife even says like, well, we can go to Vegas next year for our uh, uh, anniversary or something. Yeah. And I, I used to go to Vegas all the time for work. So the, that to me is like kind of disappointing, but I do actually want to go to SEMA. So that was kind of the, the part <laughs> I was excited about. And uh, everyone I talked to, it really sounded like this past year was the year that instead of like electric vehicle and kind of resto mods being in the back, it really was a pretty big portion of it and pretty front and center. Um, were there any things that really stood out to you? And is that pretty accurate of what your experience was too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the industry's come a long, long way. Um, you know, when we first displayed at SEMA in 2021, um, Mitchell from Torque Trends was there I remember that year. The, the Monday like opening ceremony, they had their, like feature vehicles drive over this stage. It's just for industry and, and exhibitors. And um, of the seven that drove over this this stage to display and talk about the hype up of the show, um, four of them were EV. And it was like, whoa, oh, wow. this is crazy. Like we're showing up on the scene in perfect timing. And then you walk into the show, and and Mitch from Torque Trends will tell you like, I was here ten years ago, and. Uh, it's the only EV company. Like there's nobody here. There's maybe one or two other EV things, you know, nothing, nothing like what there is today. And that year, I think there were seven EV companies at SEMA, maybe, maybe five, wow. but still it was like, that's dramatic growth, right? That's, that's big. Um, and so felt like, okay, yeah, this is the time, but all of us were spread out. None of us were next to each other. We were just all over the show floor. And then the next year, a few more EV companies. And then this year, they brought all of us together in the electrified zone or the future tech propulsion tech zone. And uh, it was massive. It was really cool to see all the technology, all the cars. It was uh, definitely something that like people were coming from all corners of the expo. You'd get people coming from Apex, which is way down the strip of Venetian, be like, I I had to see what was going on. I, I heard you guys are converting a vehicle live. I just needed to see it. And so we would have like literally people standing outside our booth. We had big TV screens up, like facing down so people could see the action. And then we had four alumni from our program working together to convert the Model A Project E from gas to electric and drove in gas and it left electric uh, four days later, which was super cool. Something that's never been done before at SEMA. And so um, it was really fun to be able to show that to people and then show the quality of our training for techs who had not met each other coming together and working to convert a vehicle from gas to electric was pretty awesome. 
Yeah, that was, uh, I, I forgot about, that. that's a great, I'm glad you brought that up. That was such a cool thing that your team did there where you actually had a ICE uh, Model A drive in and then, and from what I had heard, it was even like, you had to even stretch out like the fourth day. It had converted so yeah. quickly to electric that you're like, well, okay, let's kind of slow these things down so we make it by that fourth day. But that that just kind of shows how impressive and how much that, like I'm talking about with the kit, kind of the product productization of this instead of it being a one-off kind of like homebrew build, having these yeah. just uh, interchangeable and easy off-the-shelf parts really makes this much more feasible for a lot of people uh, and yeah. I, I think a lot more approachable for traditional mechanics as well. Yeah, totally. And I'll give you the inside scoop here on, on I guess, maybe like <laughs> how how that's possible to even get done. And uh, the first piece is a huge shout out to Felton there. Universal Pack is a huge piece of what is going to allow conversions to be done way quicker. Um, and so you, you talked about this a little bit earlier, but I'll also note that Legacy V is now the distributor for that product in North America. So you can come and get it from us and we can help support you with implementing that, that product into your project, which is going to cut build time down by a ton. Building a battery pack is the biggest time suck of, of an EV conversion. So having that done for you is huge. And then realistically, we built that car and I want to say about a month before we came to SEMA. So we had built it, we had then taken it apart and then put it back together to test to prove that, you know, we can do this. We can we can get it done in four days. So the motor mounts, the brackets for the battery box that are going to fix it to the chassis, all that stuff was done. So it's not like we were, you know, fabricating and welding there at the show. We had right, all that right. stuff pre-done. But I mean, we did it in I want to say like six and a half hours or something like that. Cause we had to give people longer lunch wow. breaks. We had to spread it out. And so <laughs> it just shows the opportunity for these these kids that are make model specific, how fast you can get it done. And then even then the amount of work that went into it before the show was was not some, you know, outrageous lift. It was a much simpler version of what what is normally done when you have that pack ready to go. So that was very cool to be able to use that and show it at SEMA. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that was just a really one great press for you guys, but two, just a really cool way to show that this has gone to a point now and how quickly you can do it. And once again, once you kind of hone in on uh, certain types, uh, certain models and specific builds, I mean, like Filton's doing, they've got a mini Cooper, they've got a Porsche and obviously the defender, uh, kits that really dials in what you need to do and makes it so much easier, which I guess does make me wonder. I'd heard that the Defender build was coming sometime in Q2 of this year through you guys. Is that still, or is that something you can share any more details on? I can't share any more details on it right now, okay. but that is, yeah, that is correct. That is the plan for uh, that kit. And there is a ton of interest in it. So I'll just throw this out there that if people are interested, reach out. We've got a queue of people that are lining up to be able to get their hands on that product. And uh, we're really excited to be able to launch it. And it's going to be, it's going to be big for sure. Yeah, I can't wait. I know I emailed Tim, and so I've been in that queue myself for already a couple Good. of months. <laughs> but yeah. uh, just everything I've seen, even on Felton's website and talking to Chris, it looks like it's such an awesome product. So I'm, I'm excited to see it. Um, yeah. So uh, kind of going about that, talking about Felton, talking about some of these other vendors, can you share some of the, um, and obviously I realize maybe you can't always say uh, names, but can you share what Legacy EV does to like kind of, vet a vendor and uh, how they yeah. choose which ones to work with and if there are any entertaining stories of like okay we're not going with those guys obviously you don't have to say the company but if you can share anything about that like kind of happens because i'm i i mean in my own uh professional experience i i've had to sometimes test vendors and um you can be quickly surprised by even though you put out a really clear rfp of what you need uh, it hasn't yeah. made it past the first 10 minutes of uh, <laughs> unboxing it even. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I have any like negative <laughs> stories that I can share right. or, or would share, but fair, with, that's fair. definitely, <laughs> that's definitely the value we try and bring to the industry as a distributor. We want to vet products that yeah. uh, we trust. And so I, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but we have parts distribution. It's kind of like one arm of the business and then education is the other arm. And the third arm that we don't talk about very often is research and development, R&D. So we have a whole R&D shop that is like the necessary third leg to the stool that makes it all stand up because we bring these products in from new vendors and we want to validate them and make sure that they work. So 
We have like two kind of different types of products that we offer when it comes to EV hardware on our site. There's kits and then there's parts. And so when a product comes to us as a kit, it, it gets validated and installed before it gets launched as a kit. So then it'll come with, you know, a wiring hmm. diagram. It's got a bill of material that's been specced out. And then it's got the clone file for the firmware that can get flashed onto that vehicle once it gets installed. These are universal kits. So they're not the same as what you'd get with like a Felton Land Rover Defender um, kit. Right. It's not like this bolt on like wire harness is prefab. It's, you know, there's, there's wiring that you're going to do. You're going to connect it all. But that means it's a little bit more malleable into the vehicle. So you can design it how you'd like. And so creates this universal platform that's then more um, applicable to, to a wider set of vehicles. And so whenever we, we launch a kit, we do some vetting with the manufacturer. We get their product uh, in-house. We work with it. I mean, that's that's what we did with the Felton Pack before we launched it. We installed it in Project D. We put it through the test spaces and um, we're comfortable with that product before we launched it. Because we also want to be able to support the manufacturer's product out there in the wild once we launch it. And so um, it's just a part of, part of what we do with our R&D department before we launch a product, at least in the kit form. Sometimes. You know, if if we can see substantial application um, val- ver- verification from a manufacturer on like a motor, then we might offer it if we know that it's a motor that has a reputation that we can get behind and support without doing the R and D. Um, but when it comes to kits, that's that's stuff that we've worked with. Yeah, and I, I'm kind of curious. I know um, it does seem like you guys are going much more towards the kits and uh, fully new systems. But I know you've also sold like, uh, and I mean, this was a pretty common thing is used uh, Tesla powertrains, used batteries from other cars. Is that something you're still kind of continuing to do? Or do you kind of see the future probably moving maybe more away from that? You know, it's interesting. Um, Since the beginning, um, you know, one thing that Rob has said is like, this industry is going to be way bigger than how many Teslas can can get totaled. Right. Um, We need access to more parts than just refurbished Tesla equipment. Um, and so that's been a huge part of it. Wanting to create all new products for these kits that are like brand new off the shelf out of the box. That that's what we want the customer experience to be. But the Tesla name carries a lot of weight, right? And so people are really excited to be able to use a Tesla swap and, uh, as their description and Tesla swap products. So we, we still sell a lot of Tesla equipment. And I think for us, we're, our goal is to serve the industry and what the industry wants to see. And so we just have our finger on the pulse to see, okay, Tesla stuff's moving. Let's make sure we, we keep it stocked and in inventory. And we have documentation from the manufacturers that can support it. And then, you know, let's also make sure we have the best new product offerings that are coming out. And that's something that's evolving really quickly as well. Um, if you were at SEMA, I know you weren't at SEMA, but for anybody listening that was, like, <laughs> there's so many new products at that show this year. It was wild. And so even the product offerings that we had this year at the show, double what we had the year before as a, as a distributor, right? That's significant change in an industry. And so that's another value add that we, we bring to the customer, just paying attention to what is new in this space. What's the best products available on the market, whether it's controls or motor, hardware, battery, you name it. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. I'm curious, are there any technologies specifically that you've kind of seen the past year that you've, uh, like what you're talking about at SEMA, that really kind of seems to be uh, a kind of leap forward or kind of a big step for making this a lot more, uh, a lot easier and much more approachable? Um, I'm really excited about controller hardware in 2024. Um, I gotcha. think that there's some new offerings coming to market that are going to change user interface and how the builder interacts with the components in a kit. Um, I think that's going to be really cool to see. I can't talk too much about it now, but for people that are interested, like subscribe to our newsletter and you'll see as stuff comes out. Um, but I think that's a big one. And then, uh, yeah, battery technology is, I mean, it's shifting battery packs coming to market that are just make things way easier to do is super cool. So I think packs and controllers are the two that I'm looking forward to. But then, I mean, there's a, 800 volt Tremec motor that makes like a thousand horse. That's also at SEMA. So excited to see that. It's, <laughs> it's hard to pick. I don't know, but controllers and batteries right. will stick with that. Is my is my first and final answer. <laughs> well, and I I think those are things that will impact everyone and make their lives a lot easier. The thousand yeah. horsepower motor will be definitely very cool, but probably much more limited uh, use cases. 
with yeah. um I, and i realized like within like the last couple of years especially in the automotive space so much of this has been supply chain it's like one month it's this is hard to get another month this is hard to get um has there been anything that you guys have kind of consistently seen or just has been a challenge you know for builders that um, for certain parts to either get or certain parts that you guys do a really good at job of making sure you have so for a builder that's trying to find xyz part you are kind of the guys that'll definitely have it yeah well yeah there's a lot i could talk about in that question it's there's there's a lot to it i think anybody who's done a conversion before sees a ton of value in what we bring because there's like 60 different components from multiple like probably close to two dozen manufacturers that you got to source parts from to just right. get like a, a working kit and then on top of that now you've got supply chain delays and um i mean we've seen so many things impacting supply chain i never thought i'd be subscribed to like a supply chain newsletter but like i'm like watching ocean freight news and i'm like oh my gosh Maersk is like routing ships around the southern tip of africa because there's pirates in the canal like right. they're doing things that are different I'm like why am I, why is this my life why am i paying attention to this now but it's just the <laughs> reality of where we're at as an industry the supply chain is still recovering post covid and so it's really hard to get yeah. components and equipment especially internationally and so um it's definitely a, one of the biggest things that we spend time focusing on i have weekly supply chain meetings with our supply chain team I'm like okay what are we what do we low stock on what's the lead time what do we need to do to get it here and so we have we have orders that are waiting on components that have been waiting on components for a couple of weeks and or, or more in or in some cases and that's always hard to have a conversation with the customer where it's like yeah this DC to DC converter is out of stock and it's not going to be in stock for another eight weeks I'm sorry like we're going to work on it we'll get more we'll get it to you as fast as we can um, so anybody that's tried to navigate that on their own is like thankful that we're navigating it for them but anybody that's new to it is like doesn't understand there's like 60 components that we got at source from all over the yeah. world to make this thing work and it's complicated um that's a big part of it and then uh yeah diving into like what specifically is a, is a bottleneck i think um transmission adapter plates is is the one that comes to mind of oh, like interesting um there's not a lot of manufacturers for transmission adapter plates and they're often made off of um molds and so you have to order them in yeah. larger batches to be able to get them at, at low cost and so it just creates complications for the manufacturer because they're like okay i have one for this obscure year vehicle that we have designed but i need eight more to be able to do a run that i can make these at an affordable price and so that's something that will change with volume as the industry gets bigger um, but that's something that has been, a, I think, a big bottleneck for builders. It's like they're waiting for, for three months sometimes for a transmission adapter plate. And it's like everything's mounted and ready to go. I just need to be able to mate the motor to the transmission. Like how long will that take? And that's always tough when somebody's ready to go and they have to that's, wait for a part. Yeah, that's super fascinating. You actually say that. I should talk with you offline. But there is a couple of guys locally that have a CNC shop that are actually looking. They were asking me if there's a need for that. And I figured there was. Um, yeah. Their focus is really traditional four by fours, uh, old G wagons and defenders. Um, oh, cool. but it, yeah, I mean, it, that's, that's really interesting and that totally makes sense, but I can definitely intro you to them if that, uh, fits with you guys, but, yeah, um, sure. have, have, have there, ever, have there ever been, um, anything, I mean, it, it sounds like the, uh, and it totally makes sense the way you guys are doing stuff, but it has your team ever looked at ever manufacturing certain things that them, uh, yourselves or, is that kind of still out of the realm of being practical for the team? Um, it's not that it's not practical for us. Um, the opportunity has arisen countless times for us, but we are yeah, laser yeah. focused as a company on being a parts distributor. And the, the importance of like staying away from manufacturing as a parts sure. distributor is we don't want to manufacture a product that competes with our vendor partners. We want to just support the products that manufacturers yeah. make the best that we can and that allows us to stay laser focused on how can we sell your product better how can we support it better and then how can we help find opportunities to create other products that can support it better and so we have open dialogue with our manufacturing partners of like we need xyz products to better support what you've designed out there in the wild and um that just helps us stay laser focused there's definitely an opportunity and we've definitely been like tempted by it in the past but have definitely like definitely stay focused on where a parts distributor we are not a manufacturer let's let the manufacturers manufacture and we will support 
That makes sense. And yeah, I, I was just curious, but I totally understand yeah. that. No, it's a um, good question. <laughs> given that we have been talking so much about EV conversions, and when I was there, yeah. I can mention, as you, as you corrected me, the Ford F100, that was kind of a fun thing. <laughs> but you guys also had that beautiful old Cadillac. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm kind of curious what conversions you've been wanting to do, if, or if there's any other kind of car that your team hasn't done yet that you really are kind of excited to do a conversion of. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, so one series that I'm really excited for that we're hoping to launch this year, which we haven't really talked about yet. So I'll, I'll tell you here first, just kind of on the inside scoop, no we plan news. to do <laughs> yeah, uh, a high low series where we convert like probably, uh, an older, pretty, pretty nice C10 and then convert, uh, like a little bit newer, but still, still older S10. Um, and do the C10 oh, really nice. high budget and do the S10 really low budget and then take them to car shows and like compete against each other about who can get like more street cred for the budget. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be like $250,000 budget versus $25,000 budget. I don't know if those are the numbers, but that's, that's right, the plan. Right, right. And so if anybody knows Rob and I, he's obviously the high budget guy and I'm all obviously the low budget guy. I was trying to finagle my way into the carpool lane. Yeah, almost yeah, 10 yeah. years ago now. And and he's, yeah, he likes nice cars. And I like saving money. So <laughs> we'll see. We'll see who's can beat who's in the competition. But that'll be fun. So are you going to convert an old VW Jetta? Is that what you're thinking? Or is there any car in particular that stands out? So, I mean, you've got something secret. You want to wait till... Well, my team will do the S10. That'll be that'll be my car, and Rob's gotcha, will be gotcha. the C10. Um, so that'll yeah, be yeah. the first one. But um, I'd really like. Okay, to I, do I wasn't old... for sure if those those cars had been chosen yet. For sure, I got you, got you. Yes, yeah, those are chosen. But right. for a personal vehicle, um, we did a, an FJ80, and I love that. Oh, cool! Car. Like that. If I could just pick one to do, that would be the yeah. one that I do um, just cause it's fun. I, I was able to do a lot of the test mileage on that car before it was shipped out to the customer. I just love driving it. Um, another one that I'd love to do is a Fox body Mustang. It's a tribute to oh. vanilla ice and <laughs> <laughs> 5.0. No, I, I think that'd be a great one too, just because you've seen so many and uh, don't be wrong. They're great of uh, the classic Mustangs, but to see the Fox body, I feel like those have kind of had a bit of a, uh, resurgence especially when you're talking about street cred that yeah. that right now seems to be one of the hot ones uh, yeah and then... they have they weren't very popular for for a long time <laughs> and they've they've come up a little bit in popularity now but they're still they're not the coolest mustang that's for sure but they i think it would be really fun especially to try and do it on kind of like a budget build and yeah keep keep a manual transmission and do some burnouts it'd be a good time yeah that'd be perfect for that and it's funny you say the FJ80 because that was, I was looking at either that or an FJ60 before we got the Defender um, mm. and have now gone down the probably less reliable, but more expensive. And just, I'm so in love with Defenders now. I mean, I, I still love the the Toyotas, uh, the Land Cruisers and all of that, just that whole generation from FJ40, 60 and 80 and beyond. But I think yeah. really the 60 and 80 are my personal favorites. But yeah, uh, yeah, I I would love to see more of those conversions and see what people do, especially more for like making a specifically off road build, and kind yeah. of doing some really cool stuff with that. Totally. Uh, now, with with everything you guys are doing, like, where do you see like the industry kind of headed towards in like the next five years? Do you see it just really fully taking off, or do you see kind of certain trends? Um, or any like kind of goals you guys have that you want to see kind of take off more over the next five years? Yeah. I mean, I think we're going to continue to see really rapid growth similar to what we have seen in the last four years. Uh, but I think just at a larger scale, um, I think the introduction of some of this technology for manufacturers that makes the conversion a little bit simpler is going to be a big part of what helps like catalyze that growth. And then I think education is the other big piece of it that helps people to adopt adopt the technology more and so i think just just more of those things for sure out there um i think we're going to also see um an era of people doing stuff to their oem evs you know you have the one of the only kia ev6s in your neighborhood but you're like i want it to be different once the second one shows yeah. up you know you're like oh i want this to be cool and unique and so what can i do to customize this car and i think 
that'll be something we're seeing. We're seeing it a lot in the Tesla Model, Model 3 world right now. For sure. Just like what, what kind of body kits can you add or um, air ride or different things, you know? And so I think that's going to happen a lot in EV. And um, stay tuned for, for what our presence will look like in that space as well. Um, we're supporting a couple of projects around that and excited to oh, cool. support the consumer in, in modifying their existing EVs. Um, yeah, and then I think just bigger footprint with training. I think colleges adopting programs that focus around the EV conversion is going to be a big part of it because we can leverage what their programs currently teach around gas-powered technology and then enhance that through the gas to electric conversion. Very cool. And I'm, I'm kind of curious. I know we talked with Chris also about this around um, fast charging as kind yeah. of being a more common option maybe in EVs. I think it's a little more defined also in the European market for that. But is that something you guys are also kind of paying attention to and kind of seeing an interest in that? Or is it mostly these are just kind of viewed as uh, second kind of cars for around town? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. When we started, it wasn't available. And people would ask, can yeah. you fast charge yet? And we'd be like, not yet. We know manufacturers are working on it, but it's not there yet. And uh, it's here now. You can fast charge. Amber right. EV has a system that you can fast charge. Um, the Felton Pack is capable of fast charging. Actually, we were just talking about it the other day. We took it to a couple of different fast chargers to test how it did. And it fast charged on multiple. Um, JJ was just telling me about that this morning. And so um, it's here. It's available. Nice. Super cool that it's available in the aftermarket. That's going to make it much more accessible for people too. Um, yeah, we're excited about it. Well, I, and I, I just want to say thank you so much for this, Maverick, because I realize we're kind of coming up on our time here and I could easily keep asking you questions probably for another hour, if not two. Um, but thank you so much. And for sure, we'll probably have to have you on soon, especially once this Defender kit goes live, because I can't, I, my, I know my wife is even tired of me talking about it uh, since I can't even look at what it is beyond kind of the spec page that's already up there. But yeah. Um, thank you so much. Uh, this is great. And I, I know our listeners have really enjoyed kind of learning more about this space and having people like you on. Of course. Thank you for having me. It was fun to get to chat and uh, excited to see your Defender project take off and be a part of that. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> thank you. Same here. My <laughs> pleasure. With, with that, we'll let you get going. I hope you've enjoyed this deep dive with Maverick, the co-founder of Legacy EV into the realm of electric vehicles, electric conversions, and the vital importance of education for shaping the future of the industry. Legacy EV is not just an aftermarket automotive company, but a catalyst for change in the electric vehicle space, providing parts, distribution, and invaluable workforce development opportunities. They're also providing hands-on learning experiences that are driving the force behind mastering EV technology and helping push the industry to implement safe standards for EV technicians to follow. This is ensuring a bright and sustainable future for the EV industry, and I was really honored to be able to share this with you today. As we heard, despite supply chain challenges, Legacy EV remains committed to overcoming obstacles and delivering top quality conversion solutions. As we look ahead, the electric vehicle future is brighter than ever with exciting projects on the horizon, industry growth, and really limitless customization possibilities for electric vehicle enthusiasts. I know I am, for one, excited about what this kind of unlocks, especially for a lot of traditional cars that probably didn't have the best powertrain even when they were combustion engine, but may have had a great exterior and interior, and this really kind of is able to give these cars a second chance, along with really making it uh, much easier for people who may have a family car that they've always had strong kind of like uh, emotional connection to. But now with this ability, they can actually kind of not only make it electric, but just also bring down the maintenance to make sure it stays in the family for much longer. So we really hope you're charged up about the future of electric vehicles as we are after this convo with Maverick. And be sure to stay connected with us here at Great Connections for more episodes and insights into the world of EVs. Until next week, remember, whether you're a seasoned electric vehicle enthusiast or new to the world of electric mobility, the Great Connections podcast is your go-to source for all things EV and how they tie to our ever-changing electrical grid. Thank you.